So in my initial impressions of Monk video, I talked about showing you the Flurry of Blows build and the Stunning Strike build. But before that, I have to show you the main class. We have to go through the main class, so we're gonna do that first. So starting out from the very, very top, we have our hit die as a D8. This is lower than what we'd want. A D8 is usually for like a hit and run marshal, like a rogue, and it's not for a marshal that needs to stay up close. Every other marshal that needs to stay up close is going to have a D10 or better. Many of them even have archery options, which for most monks isn't a great option. So I would say our hit die are among the weakest in the game. The only people who struggle more with their hit points are probably going to be bards. And I hear you saying wizards and sorcerers have a D6, but they have a ton of defensive options right from the get-go. And so no, I do not consider them struggling more with their hit points than monks do. Proficiencies. We also do not come with near as good of proficiencies as the rest of the marshals. We get no armor. We only get simple weapons and short swords. So our... our Weapon options are very, very limited. We get one type of tool or a musical instrument. I consider that more flavor than anything, but tools can be cool, especially if you have a DM who lets you do a lot of cool things with them. But for the most part, pretty flavorful. Saving throws, strength and dexterity. I'm not gonna do this often throughout this. I know monks have their issues. I'm not gonna focus in on them too much, but this one I do want to focus in on for a minute. Dexterity makes a ton of sense for monks. Strength makes zero. Their whole class actively convinces you never to do anything with strength. So having proficiency in a stat that you have been convinced to dump is really irritating. I understand why, because they don't want you to have two big saving throws, but this clearly should have been wisdom. It is a dexterity wisdom based class, but that's all I'll say about that. We will just deal with what we have, strength and dexterity. And I would say these are pretty bad saving throws for the monk as they stand, because monks come with evasion. Evasion basically takes care of your dexterity saving throws. You don't need dexterity saving throws. Strength, as far as your weak saving throws go, strength, charisma, and intelligence are the weak saves. Dexterity Dexterity, Wisdom, and Constitution are the strong saves. Every class gets one and the other. So as far as our the weak saving throw, it's a good one to have. I'd say strength comes up quite a bit more often than intelligence and charisma, but the effects are often not nearly as devastating as intelligent and charisma, so it kind of balances itself out that way. But in any case, moving on to our skills, we get to choose two from acrobatics, athletics, history, insight, religion, and stealth. Stealth is great, and acrobatics is good for grapple defense more than anything. Athletics, history, and religion we really can't take because our skill points just will never go into those, so that leaves insight as our social skill, and that's basically what monks are going to do in charisma situations is insight people. So one thing I will say about the monks is that they do not need equipment basically at all. They can get by with very, very little equipment for the whole campaign. So they're really good at giving their money to party members who really need it. Thinking like wizards who need money to write down their spells. And they're really good in campaigns where equipment is very, very low. That's something we don't talk about a lot with monks, but there are campaigns where they can really shine if equipment is limited. Moving into our actual features now, we have unarmored defense. While we're not wearing armor nor a shield, we can take our AC as 10, plus our dexterity modifier, plus our wisdom modifier. So Anywhere from generally around 15 to 20 will be our AC as a monk. With the plus one, plus one, plus one as a standard take nowadays, we can basically expect to start out with 16, which is okay. But with the D8 health, 16 AC, we're really not tanks. That's That can't be overstated here. We are far squishier than most frontliners. At level one, we also pick up martial arts. Altogether, what this comes down to is that we are likely going to be picking up a quarterstaff or a spear because it's versatile, simple. Let's just have, it have a D8 for our base attacks. Then we can use our bonus action for our d4 attacks using dexterity instead of strength and we get to modify the damage we do. This is pretty dang strong. If this was just base classes this is among the best marshals coming out the gate. We get our free bonus action attack. If bonus actions weren't so unanimous in the game this would be incredible. And I get why designers would look at this versus a fighter and be like oh we actually need to tune fighters up and give them their feats and whatnot because on paper monks actually outshine fighters for damage until we start mixing in all the other mechanics that come in the game outside the base class. But moving on, we're going to move on to our key. So our key is going to always be equal to our level. So for level two, we have two key points and that's our monk level. So if we've multi-classed, then it's always still just going to be our monk level. And we can use our key to do different things. So we can spend one key to do flurry of blows. So in many ways, this is a key point for one unarmored strike. This is a pretty poor use of a key point unless we do a lot to change it. It scales as we scale our monk die it scales as we get more uses of it. But overall, Flurry of Blows is pretty underwhelming. Patient Defense. You spend one key point to take the dodge action. And we can do this as a bonus action. So now we have Martial Arts as a bonus action. We have Flurry of Blows as a bonus action. We have Patient Defense as a bonus action. And the dodge action as a bonus action is actually pretty sick. That's a very strong defensive option. That's a worthy of a key point. Step of the Wind. You can
can spend one key point to take the disengage or dash action as a bonus action on your turn and your jump distance is doubled for the turn again we have another bonus action so monks start off super bonus action heavy so what that means for us is that when we're taking races we really don't want to be stacking more bonus actions on top of this we want to focus on reactions and actions or best of all passive strengths Keep that in mind. Now disengage or dash, we really can't be spending them often, so we have to get a ton of use. Keep in mind that it's all situational. Sometimes a dash is exactly what you need to get through that door before it fully shuts. Read the situation that can all be useful given the right moment. Also at level two, we begin our unarmored movement. So long as we don't have armor or shield, we get a faster movement speed. This is one of Monk's greatest strengths is their mobility. And starting at this level, we get 10 feet of extra movement. And by 20th level, we have 30 feet of extra movement. And so it just incrementally increases as we level up. Moving into our first optional trait, we get dedicated weapon. Pretty much the same as what it would be, except now we can do martial weapons instead of simple weapons. And the biggest thing to consider is that that will give us a D10 instead of a D8. If we can get a race or some other way of getting proficiency in a martial weapon, this is good. It's not something we need to go crazy out of our way to make happen. It's essentially plus one damage to every attack. And that's good, but again, we can do something better with our build. We don't need to make this part of our build. A D8's fine. At level three, we pick up our subclass as well as deflect missiles. Deflect Missiles is a reaction that lets us take an attack that has a projectile and we can reaction reduce its damage. It's reduced by 1d10 plus our modifier plus our monk level. That math is really heavily skewed in our favor. And if we reduce it to zero damage, we can use a key point to grab the, the item and throw it. It has a range of 2060 and it counts as a monk weapon as soon as we throw it. I do not love using my key for this other than it's cool. It's really meant to be a reaction to block a really powerful projectile attack. Crossbows, like a heavy crossbow, is where this particularly shines. How often is that coming up? Not often, but it's there for when it does come up. Our next optional feature is key field attack. So this is a way to take a lot of these subclasses who are using key during their action and not really doing the martial portion of their class that we can now do a martial thing. How good it is is really dependent on your subclass. There's one subclass I think this one really stands out on, but we'll get to that at another video. So then we get slow fall. Slow fall is probably my favorite monk feature in the game. You can use your action when you fall to reduce any falling damage you take by an amount equal to five times your monk level, which the math really works out because the damage for per 10 feet is a D6, an average of 3.5. And on average for your monk level, you're reducing it by five. You're outpacing the amount of 10 feet you're going. So if you're monk level five, you can easily jump off of a 50 foot building with a reaction. But this being a reaction does create situations where you've already used your reaction and you're falling like anyone else and just splat. So keep that in mind. Also at level four, we get another optional feature. This is called quickened healing. This is pretty garbage mathematically. The only time you really want to use this is if you're going to be using a bunch of hit die right before a short rest. You can spend all your key points to try and heal up as much as you can, keeping in mind that you might be ambushed, and then you can save some of your hit die for another short rest down the line. Not very good. Fifth level's extra attack, that's a D8 for us, so we have one of the weakest extra attacks in the game. Not all extra attacks are created equal, even though they have the same name. A fighter's extra attack is going to be much better than a monk's we have probably the weakest. Also at level five, we get Stunning Strike. So Constitution's a really tough one to target, but we can do it multiple times a turn, making it more likely to happen. And there's ways to build around this and optimize it. Stunning Strike, I think, is our most powerful key feature. And so building around it is often a good idea. At level five, we also get focused aim. This is another optional feature. At this point, I'm going to say that I think all optional features for monks should absolutely be allowed. None of them break the game and they can help certain builds. So definitely allow them. At level six, we get key empowered strikes. Now our unarmed strikes are treated as magical. At level seven, we get evasion, which makes our failures as good as our old saves and our saves just absolutely reduce the damage to zero. This feature alone is better than any amount of proficiency in dexterity saving throws. It's just an auto save on base dexterity. To me, evasion, if you have it, you really don't need dexterity saving throws. Monk's no different. Also at level seven, we get stillness of mind. We can use our action to end one effect on ourselves that is charmed or frightened. This can be good, but a lot of times charmed and frightened force us to do a certain action, so it doesn't allow us to do the action to end it. The charmed or frightened often counters what's supposed to counter charmed or frightened, which generally is saying something poor about the design, and I think this feature could improve in its design, but with how it stands, it will situationally come up. At level 9, our unarmored movement allows us to run across liquids and up walls without 
falling until the movement ends, which is kind of cool. You can do a lot of cool mobility with that. I actually really like that feature. At level 10, we get purity of body. We're now immune to disease and poison. Immune to poison is fantastic. Immune to disease, depending on the campaign, isn't bad, but disease doesn't come up super often. At level 13, we get tongue of the sun and moon, which allows us to understand and speak any language of any creature next to us. So we can't read it, but it allows us to be understood and to understand them spoken language. Level 14, we get diamond soul, which gives us proficiency in all saving throws. That's amazing. That's a, a very standout monk feature. At level 15, we get timeless body. We can't be aged magically, so we just die once we reach our natural age, and we no longer have to eat or drink. It's purely flavor. Empty body allows us to spend four key points to become invisible for one minute. During that time, you also have resistance to all forms of damage, but besides force damage. Additionally, we can use eight key points to cast astral projection. We don't need any material components to do this, and when we do so, we can only go ourselves. We can't take other creatures with us. And finally, at level 20, we get perfect self that if we roll initiative, we do not have any key points. We now have four key points, which just allows us to be a little bit more generous with our key point use throughout the day. So let's kind of start talking about this. That was just kind of our overview, but let's break it down a little bit. The first thing I want to talk about is scaling. So how martial scale is different between martials. You have fighters who just continually get extra attack. You have barbarians who get better critical hits. You have rogues who scale in sneak attacks. You have rangers who scale in spell slots. You have paladins who get improved at divine smite, so their base attack just do extra damage. Now, monks are one of the weirdest scalers because they scale their martial arts die, and that's pretty slow and not the biggest deal. Then they scale their key point usage, which if you're thinking about it through flurry of blows is essentially every level we get one extra unarmed strike per short rest, which is gonna equal, if we're lucky, three a day. So it's just completely inferior to extra attack. And then we also get one extra attack. So as far as our scaling goes, we're better than barbarians and rangers for their late levels. We scale better. Rangers arguably because they can have powerful spells, but as far as just base damage goes, we do scale better. Everyone else scales better than us. Rogues, fighters, paladins, they all scale better than what we do. The next thing I want to talk about is our features are all very situational, almost across the board. We do have some universal ones, but we have a ton of situational ones. But I will say that it never really feels terrible to level up in Monk because you improve every level in very tangible ways. It's like little improvements overall, but there's always some improvement. Instead of getting this big, okay, we have new spell levels, that's a huge level. We have fewer of those huge levels, but every level is consistently improving us. Just looking at the base class, if we were saying that all of our key features are essentially spells and our key points are spell slots, we have a very small selection of what we can do with our key, most of which is situational, the few of which that aren't situational are around first level spells. So it's not crazy power each key point, but the nice thing is we can use them often. We have far more and we can stack them on a turn. So we have advantages and we just need to really lean into those advantages to exploit the most we can out of the monk. So for my next two videos, I'm gonna be talking about two base monk builds that I think optimize flurry of blows and stunning strikes. So please join me for those. Looking forward to it and I'll see you on the next one. Later.